Can everyone hear me at the back as well? All good. Can you read the screen as well? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, hi everyone. I'm Sid. I'm going to be talking about cooperative agreement today. Um, I I sort of made up this term, so I'm going to explain what it means first. Um, the idea is that if if some parties communicate and they have a shared understanding of a thing, then agreement means that after ta talking they have the, sh the same understanding of the shared thing. And you can relax this definition a bit such that you can talk more than once and however much you want, but after some finite amount of talking, you should have the same understanding of something. And this, this um, I'm talking about data structures in memory, even though this seems to apply quite well to people talking as well. Um, so two parties have the same, have an understanding of a thing, a data structure in memory, and they want to somehow agree on what they talk about. Um, there are some examples of this where, uh, on, on the internet, so you have Google Docs, for example, where you have an online version of agreement on a textual document. And uh, by online, I mean that every party that is accessing the document needs to be able to, um, on, needs to be online in order to make any edits to the document. Then there is Git, which is patch-based such that um, what you send over only needs to be the difference between the last time you sent something over. Um, and then there is Bitcoin, which is not cooperative, but it's still an agreement on a ledger. Um, and then there is Dropbox, which is state-based, where you don't need to sell, send over the entire state, but in order to see what needs to be updated on either side, you need to consider the entire state of the situation. Of course, there are optimizations going on on the hood, but the, this is an example of agreement. These are some examples of agreement. And then there is recently also the small sync, which is where this entire work came from, um, so where you can synchronize small files across multiple devices. Okay, so that's agreement. Here are some examples. And now there are some properties of this agreement that we would like. So the first one is that if one of the parties changes what they have locally and then talks, then the change should appear on the other side as well. And um, the, the change should be agreed upon eventually. And if both of them somehow change their thing, then they should find common ground in such a way that they can still agree on something afterwards. That's the second property. The third is that if I make a change and I talk, that the change doesn't suddenly disappear somehow. Um, and the, the last one is that, if this is purely for optimization's sake, if I don't do anything and you don't do anything and then we talk, we don't need to talk much. That would be ideal. Um, so the solution I'm going to present today is called Mergeful and the situation is as follows. We make a few assumptions. First is that the parties trust each other and you can solve this kind of problem in many ways, which is why I don't solve it here. And I just assume that you can trust the parties. You can do this using some um, cryptography, for example, but that's not the topic. And uh, the other assumption that I make is that there is a central server and then there are many clients talking to the one central server. Right? So the clients don't talk to each other is the idea. Um, and then, so for an, as an example, there is SMOS where you have a central small sync server, you can have a small client and a small automated system that, that just talks, they all talk to the central server and they somehow synchronize their files. That's the, the, the architecture sort of. And here is the diagram of what's going to happen in the course of doing the talking. So. On the left-hand side, you have the client. On the right-hand side, you have the server on the vertical axis. And then the talking happens in the middle. At some point, a client will make a synchronization request based on what it has locally. What it has locally is the value that it thinks about and also some metadata about it that, is, that I'm going to show you in a moment. That's the client value. The server also has some metadata and the actual value. Together, that's the server value, and they're slightly different. The server makes a sync request. And then when it gets to the, uh, sorry, the client makes a sync, re sync request. When it gets to the server, the server uses both the sync request and the server value together, process, does some processing and produces a response and also a new server value to use after the talking. When the client then gets the response, it has to merge in the, re the response with the value that it already has to produce the new value. The other assumption I'm making here is that the client doesn't somehow disappear after it sent the sync request. That's also something you can um, take care of somehow, but that's not a problem I've solved here. So here are some 
prerequisites I need. In order to do the actual synchronization, we need to somehow agree on an order of events. And the way I've solved this is by using a sort of single node vector clock where the server takes care of what time is it. But there are some problems with time in computer science. First of all, you need to um, look at a clock, which is an IO in Haskell. So I try to abstract away from time for that reason, but also others, namely that time is not linear in computers. Time doesn't run equally fast on other computers and computers don't agree on what time it is and they cannot be made to agree on what time it is. So instead of that, we're using some sort of a version number, which I call the server, server time. And you don't need to use IO in order to produce one of those because you can start at zero, which is um, a nice bit of simplification there. And then there is a timed value, which is just a value and a time. So what the client maintains on its side to synchronize on, a, on, on just the value is a, a, the time, the value itself, and also it memorizes whether the value has been changed since the last time it got synced. Um, this will be useful in, in what follows. The server just keeps the, the server time and the value, and then the sync request only needs to not send over the value if the value hasn't been changed, because you'd be using bandwidth that's not necessary. So it only sends over the version number, and if it has been changed, then it does need to send over the value with the time as well, so, and the time is necessary for the processing in order to check whether the client can update the server or whether there's a conflict. I'll get to that in a moment. In response, the client gets a, a, a response where the server can either say, everything is in sync, we're fine, in which case the server barely sends over anything. That's the part where you, wouldn't, you would prefer to not talk much if nothing has changed. If the client sent over a new version uh, and it's allowed to update the server, then it says, uh, here's the new synchronization time, the new version number that you can now use. On the other hand, if the client didn't change anything and the server did, then the server will send over both the new version and the new version number. And if the client and the server both change something and then synchronized, then there is a conflict and the client is notified of that but the server keeps the value it had. Uh, in this way, there is always some sort of, sort of source of truth on the server side. So to make a sync request, we just need to not, over send, not send over the value itself if it hasn't changed. That's quite simple. But that's really the only need, thing you need to take away from this. The actual processing is a bit more complicated to show you in code, so I'm just going to give you a diagram of what happens. Because we have these version numbers, both at the client side and at the server side, we can do the following computation at the server side in order to figure out what needs to happen. And this is where sometimes some types come in really handy. So if the, if the client sends over a, that, that, that nothing has changed, then it will send over the, the version number that it has. And if that version number is older than whatever the server had, that means that another client has synced with the server and sent it a new version, in which case the server will just send over the new version and the new version number and then the client can just take that and be in sync. If the client version is equally old as the server, then it, everything in sync and is in sync and it's fine. And now there is a, a hidden third case where if the client is newer than the version, th than the server, that means the server what you synced with is a different server than the server you previously synced with because somehow the version numbers don't match. This is where trust comes into play. Um, if the client knows I've changed something since the last time I synchronized and that thing is older than whatever the server had, then that means they both changed something and there is now a conflict in, those situ in this situation. So the server keeps whatever it had and it sends over to the client the conflict such that the client can resolve this. If the, the client version is the same age as the server version, that means the client um, made a new version on its side because it's been modified, the server generates a new version number and sends over the, the new version number to the client side such that um, the client now has a new version because the client changed something. So this is the entire overview of what you need to do to process a synchronization of a single value. Um, then the server also sends a response back. Merging the response back in is also a little bit complicated, but not very interesting. So I'm going to leave it to you. The only real important part to consider there is how you deal with conflicts. There are a few ways to do that. The first one is that uh, called the client wins, where 
uh, whenever the client gets a, uh, a conflict, it will say, ah, I'll just keep the version that I had and ignore what the server sent me. And there, there's a, a problem with that in the sense that your client and server will converge, uh, sorry, diverge on every conflict, and, but the client will never lose data, which could be something you might want. This combined with a custom way of dealing with the conflict on the client side, like for example, asking the user, hey, what do you want to do with this, can actually get you back in sync. But if you just use this, you will desync. Here is where Markdown shines and shows you that ordered lists are something it can get right. <laughs> um, I actually put one, two, three in the file, but it says one, one, so. You probably um, have a, a, a new line to match with it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> So um, equally important, the server win strategy is where the, the client just takes whatever the server gave it for, in the case of a conflict, and then th this has a nice property that you will always become in sync afterwards, but if a client made a change while the server made a change, then you will lose the data that the client uh, changed. And then there is a nice third option, which is um, wrongly named on my slide. That should be CRDT, not GADT. Oh, yeah, CRDT. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which is um, a, a fancy mathematical way of always finding common ground, but there are some restrictions to this approach, which you need to, uh, some, some invariants that you need to maintain, which cannot always be maintained, so you cannot always use this strategy, but if you can, this is clearly, op clearly optimal, because it both won't lose data and also will get you back in sync. The things that you need to do to get this, these benefits is your your conflict resolution strategy, which has to be a binary operator, needs to be idempotent, which means that syncing twice is the same as syncing once. It needs to be associative, which means that it doesn't matter in which order the clients um, merge their conflicts. And in some cases that I can't remember, it needs to be commutative, but I think that only matters if in peer-to-peer -peer transfer, so I don't think it matters here. And of course, the strategy needs to be the same on all clients, because otherwise mayhem will occur. All right, so these are the ways you can deal with conflicts. That's, that's, that's the entire story for agreeing on a single value. There are some problems with that. The first is that in order to start with a value on the client side, you need to start with some value, and there may not be such a value to start with. So um, that's one problem. The other is that agreeing on a very large value will mean that you send over a lot of data, everything, something changed, and there are a few more of these that will become very apparent very, very quickly if you ever try, start to try this. So I'll go on to two more things that we can build on top of this. One is agreeing on zero to one value, which solves the problem of you need to start with something because you can start with zero values. And the second is synchronizing an entire collection of values. How much time do I have? I don't know, half an hour at least. Okay. <laughs> All right, so to agree on zero to one values, you could argue that this is the same as agreeing on a maybe value, but it's not entirely the same. The first distinction is that um, if you agree on maybe a value, then you can't see the difference between changing from nothing to just and changing from just to just or from just to nothing. And the other thing is that if you get a conflict, then conflict nothing nothing is a valid value, but that's not something that can actually occur. So instead, we're, we're going to write some more code, and then we can actually get rid of these uh, states that shouldn't occur anyway. So the client item will now be either empty, there is no value yet, um, added, which means we've added a value, but it hasn't been synchronized yet, synced, which means it's been synchronized, but not changed, and then synced, but changed, with this, which means it's been synchronized and then changed after synchronization. And the last one is deleted, where the client has deleted the value, but the deletion hasn't been synced with the server yet. And in the case of deleted, we also don't store the value anymore to make sure that this is never needed. Uh, on the server side, it's almost the same as server item maybe A. The only difference is that you don't need to store an, uh, a time if there is no value, because you can always just start from zero. All right. So. To send a request, you do the same thing, you just don't send over the value if it's already known and not changed. The responses are now much more complicated, which is why I started with the other version first. So you can either be in sync, in which case the item can either be there or not, but in sync. Then there are three cases, both for the client and the server, where the client has changed something, or has added something, or has deleted something, and it all went fine. 
And there are three cases, the similar three cases for the server, where the server kind of added something, changed something, or deleted something, but everything went fine. And then there are three cases for conflicts. The first one is the client and the server both changed the thing that was there, but at the same time in, in, in a conflicting way. And the other two are the client changed something while the server deleted that thing. And the, the other is that the server changed something while the client deleted that thing. In both cases, all the information is back sent, sent back over to the client such that the client can fix the conflicts and do something with them. So the idea here is not to ignore the concept of a conflict, but rather to leave the client to deal with it in a way that they are forced to deal with it by actually implementing the appropriate merge strategies. So to actually implement the merging and the, um, the, the merging of the response and the processing of the sync request is like 40 lines with, with nice comments that I'm not going to uh, put you through here. But the logic is very similar with the version numbers. If you just look up all the different cases, it will match, match, out, match up if you just think through it. So it's doable. It's in the code if you want to see it. I'm not going to walk you through it here. Okay. Yes. How do these 40 lines compare to actually using the original function with, with the maybe case and sort of a default conflict resolution? Because it seems to me like, I mean, the transition from just to nothing is like from initial to zero, but then you also have deletion, which is this transition from just to nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, should I say nothing? Just, just to nothing. Just so, so these transitions make sense. Yeah. And if both of them move to nothing, you essentially don't care when they move to nothing. So if they're out of sync, you just have to default conflict resolution. They say, yeah, okay, this, this is obviously nothing. Yeah. So um, it could be that it's, it's simpler to use the previous version. The reason why I made this anyway is because it's become, going to become very important for the next step. My, my claim would be, I mean, that's a hypothesis that uh, you could represent the 40 lines function by essentially the first one plus the conflict resolution strategy, and you would, from the outside, really going to exactly the same interface, but with essentially this factoring into how to handle conflicts on holes. On, on maybe lines. So the reason why you can't is because if this is the response that you have to send, then you can't tell the difference between server added, uh, sorry, server added and uh, server changed, for example, or client added and client changed. Because going from yeah, nothing. That sounds to more like okay. You should use just the maybe. You should probably use a, a three value type. Uh, that still doesn't allow you to. Well, what do you mean by three values then? Um. So the problem with the, with the syncing is that when there is a just at the server, you don't know whether another client, the, whether there was nothing before that or just before that. Right, so the three, what I mean is the three values would be um, zero, one, and um, more than one. So essentially you, you track whether, whether it was just the value you have was really just gotten from <coughs> changing from zero to a value, mm -hmm. and then you, you keep the, you have the other representation of value rates say, oh, um, this was a value which actually came from another value that I already had, it's the yeah. changed case. Yeah. I mean, I would you have much more experience with the code, I just look at it as there's a lot of commonality, like client yeah. data change deleted, it's, it's fully repeated just with, with different arguments. Yeah. Um, and 40 lines of caseful code, if, if there's some factoring, it's always nice. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I will you have to look at it. I, I, I will want to look at it afterwards, but at the moment, Not here, <laughs> at, at the moment I will uh, go forward and you'll see why this will become useful. So even if you can implement this in the case of the previous case, you still need this. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So for the last part, um, it's about synchronizing a collection of values. And you may think, well, this is like synchronizing on a value, which is just a collection of values. By the way, the values are not ordered for um, reasons that relate to semantic correctness. And um, so you can just imagine a bag of things which have no order and no precedence whatsoever. And the basic strategy is we're going to give each of these things a name at the server side and then match up the names that we get from the client and the names that we get from the server. The ones that exist in both cases, we're going to match them up in the just case. The ones that are exist only in one case, we're going to match them up just to nothing and nothing to just. And that will somehow work out, I'll show you in a moment. But first I need to talk about what do you use for the names. So we're going to have the server determine what the name of a thing is, but the names still need to be unique across all the server and clients, 
and they need to be generatable on the client side. So some examples are use a, a, a UUID such that you can be probabilistically sure that this thing will be unique, or you use the ID of the that, that the SQL database on the client on the server side gives you as the name for the thing, and that will work as well. In order to be able to choose these things, of course, you need a parameter. So here is a, a way to represent the client side state. And there is a parameter a, uh, i, which is for the names, and a for the values. So each of the four cases in the sum type on the, in the value case are now one of the records in this, uh, one of the fields in this record. And then we need a sort of uh, validity constraint to make sure that the names are unique even within this record. So the, the sync items and the <laughs> the synced items and the sync but change items can never have um, intersecting maps, for example. On the server side, we just store a map of names of, of names to items with their last modification version number, and then the request same again. We just don't send over the items that we already know and haven't changed, and the rest is corresponds nicely to the sum type, but now in a product type where you just <coughs> let them all go into their own category. The response is similar to the sum type as well, but now it's a product type and you just put them all in the appropriate map or set. Um, again, there is some sort of validity constraint on here so that names are never duplicated. And then to actually implement this is rather complex, but the idea is to match up the items by their name and then use the previous strategy for a zero to one value in order to agree on the items individually and then put them back in the right places in the responses. Uh, so it's a nice bit, bit of using the previous part. Now the fun part for me was how do we test all this thing and make sure that it actually worked <laughs> because this was hard to get right. Um, so I had a lot of fun testing this kind of stuff. I did mostly validity based testing. I've already talked about this but I'm going to give a, a very very small introduction to that as well. Um, I didn't really use unit tests because I didn't need to. I could uh, mostly um, supply all the parameters via an argument and then generate random parameters. So here's a nice example of a custom property test that I made. This essentially says that if you sync twice, it's the same as syncing it once. So the syncing is idempotent. This is the case for values, but you can do the same thing for uh, zero to one value or for collections. And this, this nicely encapsulates one of the major properties of this entire approach. So this test alone allowed me to find a whole bunch of bugs already. And then the next up, the next ones are different ways of testing that I've also used. So the first is a property combinator, which is where you pass in a function into a other function that will generate you a property. And the example I'm using here is that when you put valid values into the server syncing function, you will get valid values out. And by valid, it means the names are not duplicated, for example. There are other constraints, but this is one of the major ones. So this allowed me to make sure in one line that I never have duplicate outputs anywhere. And then there are also test suite combinators. So that's a function that will take a function and produce a test suite. The first example here is JSON spec, which um, checks if the JSON serialization makes sense. So if you encode something, it doesn't crash. And if you decode something that you encoded, then you get the same thing back. So this test suite is generated with this, just this one line. And the second is probably the most complicated property test suite combinator that I've ever written. But it essentially says, if you give me this merge function, then everything related to the synchronization works the way it's intended, especially if there aren't any conflicts. And also the conflicts are handled in the appropriate way when it comes to the properties that need to hold about all of the merge functions anyway. All right, so you don't need to know what this means exactly. The only thing that's relevant here is that you can pass in any merge function and it will perform, generate you a test suite for that. Um, so that was the testing. This is my favorite part, of course. So if you'd like to talk about this kind of stuff, come and talk to me afterwards. This is all the content I have. So I have some more links for you. The first is merge less which is the predecessor to merge full, which is about merge-free syn uh, synchronization. So in the case where you are not allowed to modify any of the values in the bag, you don't need to handle merge conflicts because there won't be any, and that's uh, a library to implement such a thing. Merge full is what I just showed you. There is a link. 
Um, see, I said that's my blog, so I also wrote about this library in three blog posts, the second of which came out today, the next will be in two weeks. Uh, there's also the support link, in case you like my work, uh, have a look at that as well. And then there's a link to SMOS, where um, you find the, the, library, the application that I was writing that prompted this whole situation. SMOS is a purely functional semantic forest editor for getting things done. And if you like Todoist or org mode, then you will like SMOS as well, so have a look. But that's everything I have for you now, so thank you for your attention. I'm very impressed with your attention today, so have a nice evening. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. So what you're describing is sort of similar that in, in, from what I understand, that on the client, the working tree goes in some state, and then you use you dip that against um, your internal data structures, yeah. the git directory. And there you could understand that, OK, it was a new file created by this client um, against this state of the repository. Yeah. And on merging, like the, the state of the repository can make that wide enough that you cannot put actually represent that there were sort of two creators of a file with the same name, name which you can, for example, check out in the working tree with a rule of how you assign the file names in case they actually conflict. Yeah. But then, so I think the problem, so either I don't understand how you're solving the problem or the problem that you're solving is different from the problem that I have. But I understand what you're trying to do with, uh, with the working the, the difference between the working directory and the, the metadata that git keeps in .git, for example. So this distinction is already made, but it doesn't solve the problem that I have, which is why I don't understand why, don't, why I'm not sure that we're talking about the same thing. That, that might well be. So okay. It's time to go to the back one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm good. Well, uh, I might, might have missed it, but did I get it correctly that in the beginning you said that you are considering the messaging to be reliable between those parties, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. do consider the messaging to be reliable. So we are not trying to solve the, <laughs> the lost messages. Um, I'm, so I haven't thought about whether it actually matters that the messaging Ooh. is reliable. So as a result, I, I assume that it's reliable. Yeah, it matters <laughs> a lot. It will yeah. make the problem horrifically harder. Yeah? So, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So this is good. This okay. <laughs> Fair enough. I, otherwise, you probably get into conflicts with yourself that you can then trivially resolve yeah, by messaging. Basically, then you have the whole distributed consensus problem on your hands. The yeah, like classic one, right? Yeah. And that's like quite tricky. Okay. I mean, there are things to do with this. Yeah. yeah. But this is cool. This is like nice. You are basically focusing on the kind of the. Okay, I know I have these states. How do I how do I reconcile them? Yeah. Right. As like, a user of the library, that's exactly what you'll be focusing. Yeah. That's on. what. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. That's nice. It's yeah. like kind of. A, so this is all the stuff that you don't want to be thinking about when you're solving this problem. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So yeah, this is cool. the, this is exactly the kind of stuff that you that you don't want to be thinking about that the people that write papers about CRDTs don't want to be thinking about, which is why they yeah. talk about the CRDTs and not this stuff. And I find this one, I and mean, I haven't looked up if there are other libraries that do this, probably, maybe not, because sometimes it's... I haven't found any, maybe. Exactly, maybe I mean, in my experience, sometimes you actually get surprisingly, but this is a problem that pops up, uh, that, as correctly pointed out, actually, in various forms in multiple situations, so, yeah, it's actually why not have a nice library for that. Yeah, that's the idea. That's cool. The only other problem I've had with this is where if you have... Um, let's say, a, a to-do list application where you have to-do items which you could represent as the bag of things. Yeah. And then also uh, maybe like a list of friends within your to-do list applications. Um, it, you can sync those both separately, but then if you have conflicts in one and not the other, or you resolve them differently in both and they somehow, de have, somehow have dependencies, then you can still get into all sorts of trouble that I haven't thought about. Okay, I can analyze that. Yeah. <laughs> but this actually, like, just kind of do, I like analogies, so this is like to what the transaction manager would be to transactions. This is what this is for merging states, right? Yeah, like exactly. In general, let's go. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Cool. <laughs>